Hey there, folks. Welcome back to another episode of uh, this weekly, hopefully, podcast. We are here today to talk about the uh, new PHB uh, information and actually just the entire release of Dungeons & Dragons 2024, which is uh, coming up really soon. There's a really crazy sort of marketing push taking place at the moment. On Tuesday, we had the, the drop of the uh, PHB overview, and then they've just been hitting us with content 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 actually while we record this or in a, starting in a couple of minutes they'll be previewing the uh paladin as yeah well. so yeah it's uh it's a pretty exciting time to really like what uh what i've seen so far but instead of covering kind of the nitty-gritty because quite frankly there are a bunch of other channels that are more closely scrutinizing that and can do it better we are we're going to talk about kind of the a little bit more high level and in this exciting new edition. So I have with me uh, John, of course. So uh, where would you like to get started? Um, well, you had a, a really interesting like point about viewing the books more as an experience than just a source book. So I was actually wondering if we could start with your thoughts on what you're excited about on that front. Yeah, so in the uh, the PHP overview, and Jeremy Crawford made uh, made it a big point to talk about the intentionality behind the uh, the development of all three core books. So in September this year, that's when the PHP is going to drop. Uh, November, you're going to get the Dungeon Master's Guide, and then in February of next year, the Monster Manual will drop. One of the things that Jeremy Crawford talks about is just being very intentional with the style of art as you move through the book. So for example, just uh, during character creation, there's a lot of line art just to you know, represent you sketching in the the initial thoughts behind a, behind a character. Uh, the, the covers of the books have been talked about uh, a lot just because of how they're all kind of interconnected, what sorts of uh, characters they, they feature, what sorts of colors that they feature uh, on the, the individual books. And uh, when it came down, was that the art director? Okay, well, one of there was like two artists, um, but one of them was talking about how they want to see the book sit on your shelf uh, next to other books and feel kind of like an old fairy tale. You know, like it's uh, they they want to see it uh, have some you know get some wear and tear just over the years of uh, of use. And I thought that was a really uh, much forgotten about part of the, the process of designing a book in general. We treat these very much like instruction manuals nowadays. But I don't know that that should be the goal all the time. I think it's been the standard because we've, we've done that for so long. I mean, if, if you look back and like, way old school um, Dungeons and Dragons it read more like a technical manual than than a, like a storybook. Um, and kind of going back to some of that, uh, the, the focus on creativity and wonder and also just how clean everything is. Like it, it looks really good. It's formatted very, very well. Uh, but space is dedicated to making you feel like your classes, just as an example, um, are exemplified on, they have a full page spread, which is a big deal. Usually you don't tend to take up a lot of space for these sorts of things because um, you can kind of get the point across with some spot art. So just like a little character uh, amidst a field of text, but doing a full page spread, it's like, you could be this. This is what this class is all about. Uh, so just kind of the the intentionality of designing that things that way was something that I was really excited about. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know you have brought up Morkborg uh, in one of our past conversations, and I know that one of the things that that product was really uh, lauded for was its just its feel and its vibe and kind of its unusual um, artistic layout. Uh, relative to, like you said, a lot of other core rule books that are much more like instruction manuals. Um, I do think that there is like a balancing point because sometimes if you get like too creative and too fancy with the layout, you can start to make things unclear. 
So, you know, there, there's about in terms of like the book as an experience, there's the artistic vibe of it and how easy it is to reference things. Um, and also, like you mentioned with the line art, one of the things that stood out to me that Jeremy Crawford said is how they're reorganizing how they present like choices for your character uh, during character creation. So in the 2014 PHB, it starts off with uh, with your species followed by class, followed by background. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've been thinking of is starting species background than class in that you're kind of uh, looking at your character's journey from birth and then kind of moving into who they were and then now who they are. So there's kind of like a chronological approach. What I found really interesting is he said they're flipping that. So you're actually starting with class and then background and species is the last thing that you consider um, because part of what they want to emphasize is the mechanical importance of those three decisions, starting with the most important, which in Jeremy Crawford's words, and I agree with this in fifth edition is your class followed by your background, which is much meatier than it was in uh, 2014. And then species being the last thing, which really your species traits can come up a lot, but they're most impactful at level one. And as you get further on in the game, depending on your build, a lot of times they become less and less important. Um, or the things that you got from your species can be gotten in other ways, like dark vision, there's a spell for it and a potion for it. So it's, it's just interesting how, you know, there's the art side of it, but also the order that they communicate information and how that helps new players learn uh, the game faster. Yeah, it it's definitely system to system. Um, you know, like you. So I, I'm starting with uh, lineage race uh, still and in, in distal, but then move right to background because it's, a, it's such an important part uh, of your character's creation. So this is definitely one of those things where it's it's not strictly an improvement, I feel like, um, even in the the 2024 uh, guide. But I, I do think that it is a, uh, a point of emphasis that they're they're trying to kind of walk away from how important your your race, you know, species is. Uh, and this has been a movement that's taken place over, you know, the past ten years, kind of just um, walking away from some of the bioessentialism that uh, is discussed within within the sort of space and because it's not super important compared to all the other you know the the multitude of other choices that you have uh to, to make in this game it's it's more about at that point like who who do you want to be like what most closely represents your idea for for the the character instead of like oh you need these stats in order to do this other thing over here so yeah i i totally get it it makes sense for what they're going for uh, one thing that so you brought up Morkborg. People ref, so this is another people refer to it as uh, as an art book with a game attached to it, which I don't know if that's like really the direction that that you kind of want to go if you're trying to make a you know a, a rules heavy system at the very least. But uh, but Morkborg isn't that. There's a lot of uh, interpretation. So I, I think that the the need for structure is less important than you would find in something like. Uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess that just comes back to the the goal of the the books, you know, and what they're trying to design for. Yeah, just uh, one last thing before we move on. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm really pleased to hear as we're talking about the book as an experience is there's a thought of how it's used in terms of a linear flow. Like we talked about class, background, species. Um there again, I agree. It's not an improvement, but it does clearly communicate the priorities that the designers feel certain mechanics hold. Um, so the other thing is how the book is used non-linearly. So if you need to quickly look up the definition of the attack action, um, the the new player's handbook is going to have a rules glossary, which is really helpful. Um, now, as much if I criticize the 2014 player's handbook, now it's it's with the understanding that in 2014 TTRPGs were not what they are now and didn't have the same level of social accessibility as they did when the book came out. But um, what's really interesting is in 2014, there are so many like 
puzzle pieces you have to put together to figure out how mechanics work. So a great example of that is um, if you're incapacitated, uh, attacks within five feet of you are automatically critical hits, which also means if you're at zero hit points, you automatically get two death saves. And to put that puzzle piece together, like critical hits is in one section of the book and death saves is in another and the incapacitated condition is in another. So like it's not this very clean, like you can just put it together from where it is. So the fact that they're so intentioned about making it an easy experience to look up rules, um, I think is a really, really smart design choice. Yeah, I mean, they've learned so much over the past 10 years. And I think that's, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because it's be, like become the standard. The 2014 PHP is like, oh, this is how you do material. And you see a little bit of innovation when it comes to like Pathfinder's core rules. Uh, you know how they, they, they use the sidebar and they kind of uh, add different uh, the topics over there. So it's like easier to navigate. But I feel like a lot of games, a lot of people will say that, okay, d d does it this way, so we need to do it this way because obviously they're successful. Obviously, um, this is how things are done. And then they don't think about like, okay, well, but how can we do it better from that perspective? When it comes to game mechanics, we've got, we got opinions all day long, but when it comes to the actual structure of the book, it's something that's overlooked. And I I'm glad to see them uh, and move forward with with that information. Also, super excited about the character sheets. You know, and they have plenty of examples. That's one of those things where the community is really like have plenty of opinions on how to more easily organize information. And um, and I think that that's where they learn some lessons from the community. Just over you know ten years of people making their own character sheets. So it's it's really nice to to see. There's I think regardless of I mean, even on the mechanic side, we've, we've seen a lot of good things so far, but regardless of how the mechanics would actually turn out, just these strides forward with the, the book and knowing the design intent behind everything, it's going to be awesome. I'm glad you're so hopeful. I mean, I am too. It's just, <laughs> it's oftentimes, oftentimes, yeah, I, I, especially I can get a little critical of, of some stuff. Um, so, you know, we were talking about the book's goal uh, so to kind of lean that in towards more the mechanical side of what these books are aimed to do, um, right out of the gate, that overview video started with Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford just talking about they want to streamline as much of the game as possible while also making it deeper, um, which are two things I love to hear, right? And so also very difficult to do, right? Yeah. Because usually when you think about like in depth, you're, you're trying to figure out how how not to make things overly complex. So that's the that complexity is like tends to be the enemy of, well, I guess of streamlining, but also depth. And so doing both at the same time, I'm interested. Uh, how give me some examples of how they're going to go about that. Yeah. So I'm going to start with an analogy and then I'm going to dive into it. So, so give me, give me like three minutes. So, <laughs> uh, Complexity versus depth is complexity to me is how easy it is for a player to pick up what the core mechanics are. Depth are the number of meaningful choices that you have. So like checkers, for example, very simple choices, very simple outcomes. So it's got it's not very complex relative to some other board games. Um, Also, there's a limited amount of depth because it's not as complex. Chess much more complex and super deep. Like if you're looking proportionally, it, one of the things some people say about chess is it's easy to remember what the pieces do. It's very difficult to, you know, be skillful at chess. So it's not super complex, but it is really deep. And then on like the far end of the other side of the spectrum, I think of something like Magic the Gathering where super complex games, I mean, you have to take like written exams to be a tournament judge. Um, Um, However, in terms of the game's depth, if you look at like competitive decks, you're talking maybe between like four and 10 strategies. There's like, it's so complex that there are some strategies that are just so much better than others. So it actually like the complexity to depth ratio 
is way different in magic than it is in chess. Um, so Treant Monk, who is a content creator um, that I, I follow frequently, is one of many that got an advanced copy of the player's handbook. He's currently under an NDA, so he can't talk about a lot of the things. So a lot of his videos are like, I've seen what's in the book, but I can't talk about it, neener, neener. But one of the things he said on this complexity depth argument is that the games like how to play rules are a lot more concise. They've been trimmed down a whole lot, but there's a lot more player options like spells, classes. Um, there's more room dedicated to that, which might be how you do it, which is the the rules everybody knows and play, plays by. That part is simpler to pick up, but the individual class or fee options or whatever are where the depth comes in. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty fun observation about Magic the Gathering. You see it in Hearthstone, too. I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but when I'm watching a streamer play Hearthstone, uh, Hearthstone, whatever, they, they'll they be counting down the cards, and they, they'll they know what the other person's going to have in their deck and just the, the chance that it's going to pop up and then what strategy to play if it does. And that, t to me, it's, uh, I don't know, it, it takes some of the I think the lack of mystery kind of takes some of the fun out of it. But when you when you the more you play a game, the more knowledgeable about the choices you become. Uh, and nowadays we have like the community that's doing that for us. So whenever a video comes out about the monk being underpowered, it's it's like, well, everybody's going to know and think this now. Uh, that's that's my own personal personal bug there with that stuff. Just just try stuff you know save some wonder for yourself it's okay to be suboptimal yeah well it's interesting because part of it is does the thing work the way you would expect it to i think i think more than optimal that's kind of what i look at in terms of game design so mm. for a, a great example the find traps spell does not find traps so whether or not like the actual effect is powerful or not, and it's definitely not, but like that to me is less relevant than if I'm a player and I pick fine traps and I cast it, I want to find traps, not be told there might be a trap somewhere in the room, <laughs> you know, so that I, I think more than anything when that that's more where my interest lies. So if the fantasy of the monk is that, you know, you can punch someone and it deals a lot of damage and then you punch someone and it doesn't do a lot of damage like yeah it's going to it's going to be kind of a bummer um you know not to get caught up in, in nitty gritty it's just like that that's kind of like the balance i find because yeah i've seen some players go suboptimal not you other players uh and what happens is they get knocked out so early in the fight they don't get to participate mm -hmm. so you know what, what's the line between you're doing something clever and unexpected versus you don't get to participate that's yeah well when i dumped con that one time um and then got got my old character killed in uh in one round by goblins uh <laughs> that could show you the risks so uh <laughs> well, <you know. laughs> but it's uh it's kind of interesting to to think about because when you're entering a new uh version of the game you kind of you have to shake up enough of the experience so that there is that wonder. Um, you can't you can't just improve things with the with people. Um, let's see how, how am I trying to uh, convey this? So through Unearth Arcana, just as an example, there are certainly a lot of pain points alleviated by virtue of doing the new material. However, there's also a lot of really new stuff and like new concepts that they're trying to explore in uh, 2024. And I feel like that is necessary when you're doing a new uh, game in order to get people excited because the most fun that most people have when they play any game is at the start because you don't know everything because there's that gradual uh, s that curve toward mastery. You the triumphs and failures while you're in flow, you know, the, the challenging or the challenges and then overcoming that, the more you get to learn, the the more enriching uh, it is to to play to learn. So I think hopefully they've injected enough of that. There's there's definitely like so much going on 
in in the updated version of the game right now that I, I don't think that this is a danger. Uh, but it might... I actually don't know where I'm going with this, but uh, but it might be worth talking about the, the Unearthed Arcana kind of to, um, from that uh, perspective. Well, just before that, I do... I do want to kind of challenge the assertion that the most um, fun part of the game is the beginning. Uh, and I think it's game by game, but like, mm. I think about my experience with Baldur's Gate and The Witcher 3 and um, other games that are highly complex like that. Yeah, My experience has been the least amount of fun I've had is in the beginning. And I usually trust the fact, especially after playing The Witcher for a while, that once I get a handle on the game's flow, I'm going to really enjoy myself and the initial pain is going to be worth it. Um, right. But it, for TTRPGs, in a lot of ways, that's also true. Like the fact that the most exciting part is the beginning because when you have a new player and they don't have a preconceived notion of what they can and can't do yet, they oftentimes try really cool creative things that most people wouldn't think of because like you said when you can start to predict the game by playing the system enough times um a lot of times that also closes off your imagination so you know i, I just remember one of the earlier games i played uh there was like goblins in a pool of water or something or in a stream and my mom decided to cast an ice spell on the water to hold the goblins in place mechanically there wasn't anything in the system to say that she could do that but I'm the DM. I can make up whatever I want. So, so I let her have that kind of creative moment and create this new uh, tactical angle to one of her damage spells um, in how it like interacted with the water or whatever. So for TTRPG specifically, I think in a lot of ways that statement rings true. I would even I would go back to that Baldur's Gate example and 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 walk back my statement or actually add like a qualifier that you do have to be uh, there needs there's a skill floor that you need to at least be at before you can start enjoying the the grind like there needs to be a, a baseline level of, of competency or familiarity with a game like that um because I, I this was your first foray into into Baldur's gate or rather um those types of, of games if i recall correctly yep right so that that kind of makes sense but um so it's the the journey to mastery i guess is what makes you know that that fun uh yeah so let's talk about um i guess a little bit of uh the unearth our arcana uh or maybe just the the content that we haven't um seen before one of the things that's making me laugh in one of our group chats is uh is how it's like a lot of this stuff they're like this is new but we had it previewed in unearth arcana like i i just the champion fighter was one that stuck out and this one got me where he's like ah oh, fighters have advantage on initiative rolls at level three and i'm like oh that's great and i forgot that they had already play tested that in packet seven <laughs> but um uh but the thing that does excite me is historically a lot of the unearthed arcana process is almost like a movie trailer that shows too much of the movie before you get to see it mm -hmm. um so in the tasha's unearthed arcana we pretty much knew what the big systems were going to be before we saw them um things like uh the feature substitutions and enhancements where like you know barbarians could get extra skill proficiencies or whatever there were changes from the playtest material to the finalized published version but in terms of what 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 we were expecting and then what wasn't previewed in our Arcana but added to the book um, there wasn't a whole lot, and what there was was kind of like a meh level add-on, uh, in my opinion, anyway. So what was really cool was hearing how a lot of what the community has been asking for in the in the optimization community, anyway, is like uh, a preview of the spell redesigns. And mm. Jeremy Crawford said there are plenty of spells that are going to be in the player's handbook that are redesigned that were not previewed in Unearthed Arcana. So I think more than anything, what I'm excited about with these three new core books are the things that we haven't been previewed, uh, but also have kind of been designed in the background. Yeah, it's there comes a point where... Okay, so two things real quick. Um, when it comes to Unearthed Arcana, that is, that is almost irrelevant for the vast majority of people who are going to be playing the game. So if you have just 
I, I don't know numbers, but 5%, which sounds even like a lot of the people who are going to purchase the 2024 PHB, having actually played um, Unearthed Arcana prior to that, uh, you, you don't you don't go into marketing that way. Like you treat it like like everything's new. Um, they they're referencing Unearthed Arcana for for the community who is like really really ingrained. So there's like a a fine balance that you need to walk. Um, but the uh, the other thing is there's a there comes a point between Unearthed Arcana uh, and the actual final version of the game where you kind of have to uh, you have to just trust that the designers got the feedback because if you and I'm I'm only saying this because I know we've we've had a conversation about this and it's kind of a um, a uh, it's something that I care strongly about. There's only so much testing you can do. You are not testing until perfect. That is something that is untenable uh, when you have to adhere to deadlines. So, and I say deadlines as in like this is uh, this is multiple multiple departments through uh, you know thousands of people who ultimately need to be working uh, in unison to get the game to the end goal. So the game is never only about just what's in the book. It's also everything that surrounds the process. So you you can't just keep iterating until it's perfect uh, before you ship a book out. That is something that people just don't get about the testing process in general. Uh, like I see it in games. I see it in the TTRPG space. And people... Uh, in the community, when they, especially if they're invested in like, in the Unearthed Arcana or just any sort of testing cycle, they want you to, uh, they want you to show them the, uh, you know, the, the final version so that they can put their own stamp of approval on it. The thing is that you're never going to get that right either. And things are going to, like when things are actually exposed to a lar larger community, they're probably, possibly going to need to change anyway. So uh, perfection is the enemy of good. Again, it sometimes you just got to bite the bullet. And I think that the uh, designers have done a really good job kind of signaling that, uh, hey, we may not have gotten something right um, and have been willing to make corrections. And I think by virtue of going through this along uh, Unearthed Arcana uh, you know, process, they've ended up refining their understanding of the game by virtue of people um, or like seeing people test it and play it. So I think whatever is like a mystery in there that, you know, people are under NDA uh, about now is probably going to be good stuff. And they're also probably going to miss the mark on some things. And it's probably also going to be okay. Yeah, I mean, the one big difference between TTRPGs and, say, a, a video game, uh, and for, the, for a large part of video games, even this is true, um, is like, you can just change it. <laughs> If something doesn't make sense. So a great example is in the new player's handbook, uh, potions can be used as a bonus action. That has been a homebrew rule used by a lot of tables for a decade now. Um, so like if the, the one, like one of the examples of like a concern I, I have, I guess, uh, is in 2014, the invisibility condition is stupid in that like you can cast the C invisibility spell and it doesn't remove the invisibility condition from the creature for you. So you can see it, but you still have disadvantage on attacks as if you can't see it, the way the rules are written. And Jeremy Crawford said that was intentional. Like, that's like a personal, like, eh, of mine. But at my tables, right. I can just say, well, oh, it just works the way I want it to. <laughs> so, you know, when you're talking about video games, it's different in that, you know, you can't just go into the source code for like an online game and just change it to be the way that you want it. You know, we talked about, it made you chafe, but you know, I when I played Baldur's Gate 3, I played it with a mod so that the experience was more what I wanted. Um, right. But again, like, I was able to do that. So even on the video game side of things, you can quote unquote homebrew with mods. So the that that is like a lot of times when people are more concerned, I... The, the one counter argument to the homebrew thing is just how people listen to whether or not you're using a homebrew rule. I, I've definitely seen arguments at tables where somebody pulls out the book and the social layer gets really tense 
Um, so you kind of have to understand who your players are up front. But yeah, I, I think that anything I could see that would be broken or like not like they missed the mark in the design, you just you can fix it yourself, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's our game. And uh, speaking of which, uh, one of the quotes from uh, actually, I guess it's not a quote. Who's who's not Jeremy Crawford? The dude sitting next to him. I always forget. Chris his name. Perkins. Chris Perkins. Uh, uh, actually, one of um, so he was being interviewed by uh, Todd Kenrick, and they were speaking about the the DMG, so the Dungeon Master's Guide, and uh, the setting that is going to be used is that of uh, Greyhawk. But basically, there's enough information there for you to understand what the setting is is about and to also add on to it as you see fit. Because people are going to do that anyway. So there's an understanding uh, with the DMG that you... I mean, I, that's what the DMG is, is about, really, is taking everything that's in the PHP and being able to make it your own. And that's what we've been doing for the past, you know, 10 years anyway, via homebrew and, and whatever else. Uh, one of the systems that is interesting that didn't get a great reception was that of the, the Bastions system, which is still in the DMG. Uh, but it's the way that they talk about it and the intention behind it seems to, to me, mark a shift in the, the idea of how you should play this game. So just for, for everybody who's aware, uh, the Bastion system, which is optional, uh, everybody gets a, uh, a home base, basically. And it's individual. And this is the part that, that I was like, mm, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but it's like a, kind of like a second almost leveling path. It's a mini game that you play and can also play offline too, uh, if you want to. So the, the Bastions take turns um, just whenever it, it makes sense for the story or whenever there's a bunch of downtime. And in that turn, you can build up the Bastion or have the Bastion uh, undergo some sort of event back home. So for example, if you own a wizard's tower off in some remote part of the world, it is probably shepherded by some caretakers. They might be attacked by you know bandits or whatever. Uh, there might be plans that you have to improve the facilities in that wizard's tower. And so it's like this mini game. But one of the things that Chris Perkins was mentioning is that you, it's, it's an act of DMing in its own right. So you're kind of um, introducing the players softly to the idea of DMing a game so that hopefully they're more comfortable with decision-making and have an interest potentially in becoming game masters or DMs of their own for, for larger games. And I, I thought just the, that idea was really intriguing because it kind of falls in line with everything that they're trying to gear these three books toward. It's not just about the game. It's about, uh, or I guess not even just about the, the experience that the game provides, but also about the legacy that it creates, the foundation to build upon and the the community that they're trying to cultivate by virtue of you know this new edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, I've heard a lot of sides of the argument, but the argument being that you know Wizards of the Coast as a company has done some things, especially with the OGL, um, where there are definitely some some voices that are like down with Dungeons and Dragons as the most popular game, please play other systems. And I've never really had a problem with D and D being anyone's introduction into TTRPGs, it, almost like the gateway where, yeah, I, I think it's awesome to go play other systems and see, you know, what Mork Borg or Dragon Bane does. Um, that's, that's really healthy. And um, it is really cool to see that at least from, and, and this is the thing to remember, like you mentioned, where behind every book is a team and departments and stuff. The The same people that were making OGL decisions were not the same people designing the game. So to have a blanket statement of just, you know, everyone at Wizards is evil 
um, I think is, you know, grossly reductive. <laughs> but uh, when you, the, the designers, they're, they're not thinking just in terms of the game. They're thinking in terms of the broader community and new players coming in. Uh, Todd Kenrick mentioned now is a better time than ever to have a new player learn D and D because uh, they've streamlined so much. They they've had ten years of playtesting and feedback to make the game friendlier for new players and new game masters. And ultimately, I, I do think that this is a really clever way to do it because. We hear stories about the forever GMs, right? Nobody else is willing to do it. And it is kind of amazing. GMing is harder than a lot of people think it is, but it's also not as hard as as the same people think it is. It, it's like this really interesting balance of, you know, you don't need to have the rule book memorized, but you do need to be comfortable making decisions and saying no sometimes. So, <clears throat> yeah, I think even if it's not, the bastion system in particular that gets people into gming i think that just the the energetic push to try to lower the barrier to entry to have new uh game masters um it's it's an admirable goal for sure so that that covered our our run sheet to talk about uh the the 2024 edition of Dungeons and Dragons, but I I would like to get your feel on the on the marketing efforts in the space. Do you, do you have any like initial thoughts on it, or do you want me to push further? It, specifically for D and D or TTRPGs as a whole? Uh, D and D in particular. Okay, the one thing I can say that I really appreciate is the fact that they're giving any kinds of heads up about this. Um, during the Unearthed Arcana process, when I was still more posting YouTube videos and podcasts or more frequently, um, it was always really frustrating to just wake up on a random Wednesday and have an Unearthed Arcana like hour and a half video of like, hey, time to make content. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. So the the overview video, there, we have a calendar, right? We were told last week on Tuesday, you're going to get an overview video followed by this video and this video. So the one thing I can really appreciate is giving any kind of heads up <laughs> regarding this. Yeah, that makes sense. I see. I see, understand that perspective. At the same time, I also understand that like the people are just trying. They're just trying to make the game. So the fact that there's any sort of content, uh, like official content about it, honestly, just drop it whenever. It's fine. Is is my my personal take. But um, but I, I do understand the frustration. And there's yeah, it's kind of funny. But there's always this need to balance um, surprise and uh, surprise versus expectation. Um, people are, are happy when new stuff drops, but at the same time, uh, I don't know that the value of surprising them with that has ever for me, uh, paid off, uh, more than just, just planning it and talking about it in advance. So I, I don't know, but, um, they've definitely, they're pushing really, really hard, uh, the, the marketing efforts at this point. And I'm wondering because, so PHP isn't going to drop until September. September still a ways away. Are they going to maintain momentum the entire way through? I think that would be uh, unexpected if they if they were to do that, because it takes a lot of energy. Um, even their uh, the fact that they've they've just hammered us with so much content over the past two days is insane to me. It's smartly done. Let me just kind of clarify that um, you know when. When Jeremy Crawford uh, sits down with uh, Todd Kenrick to to do what what would end up being like a multi hour video, uh, and then you can take those pieces and like parcel them into smaller bits of content, like stuff about the the individual fighter subclasses and um, just different aspects of the game. That's a smart, efficient way to produce content. Uh, however, it's still there's still like a lot that you you have to get done, and uh, and to to maintain a schedule. So whoever's doing all the, the editing and then the, the social uh, needs to be planned. And then sometimes things will need to, to pivot. They don't really have a lot of room to pivot at this point because they've laid things out. And that's that's a, a drawback too of ever having a calendar or like saying that you're going to release something is that sometimes it might not be ready. Uh, it might not be the right time to talk about it because sometimes like an issue can blow up in the community. For example, if 
if Watsy had another scandal, it was talking about like, what if it was like, uh, D and D is actually all made by robots. Um, then they would be like, okay, well, we can't not put a up, hypothetical obviously. controversy there, Michael. <laughs> okay, I said robots, not AI, so it's not too crazy. Um, but the uh, it would be very like the the social media would have to to pivot. So they need to find some like like a good place with a lot of run up. Uh, they also needed to contact all of the content creators, the major ones, which a lot of them they have tie ins to. But um, like Ginny D is, you know, doing a video about this you know, subclass over here, I, th I think. Um, uh, Sherlock Holmes did one about the, the Aberrant Mind Warlock subclass in particular, like sponsored video. Uh, so there's everybody's been given a job, which is a lot of orchestration in the uh, not just like contacting all these people and say like, hey, are you ready to do this? This is how much we're willing to, to pay you for. Um, these are the beats that you need to hit but also just like figuring out all the content that should get parceled out into videos and also when those videos are going to land. Um, it's, it's an effort. So I am, I'm interested to see how long they can keep this up or if there's going to be like a, a lull uh, before September and then, you know, the ramp up things, you know, as we move into September for sure. Yeah. So the one thing I can't remember which convention is in August but I do know that traditionally there's one and they usually when, when the 2014 players handbook came out before it's like widespread distribution, um, they had it on sale at one of the gaming conventions in August. So, mm. um, so it might be that they're going to, you know, they have a big push, then the NDA expires. So instead of them pushing content, you know, the third party creators do it. Then they basically have a um, like uh, an earlier street date for convention goers so that they can start talking about it. So I the one thing about marketing is sometimes it, you don't have to do all of it yourself. If you've got right. a strong enough word of mouth, you can just create momentum and let other people talk about it, which is ultimately what makes people buy products. It's it's not the company said their product is is wonderful. It's when individual customers that we know, like, and trust also validate its wonderfulness. For sure. Yeah, no, that's a really good point um, about the timing. I didn't know the, about the, the convention, but that totally makes sense. So this is, it's very, it's interesting to observe, you know, from this perspective, just those efforts and the timing of everything too. So I, I think we're going to have a, we're going to have a interesting few months uh, ahead of us. And then, uh, then who knows what will happen after the PHP uh, itself drops. But cool. Uh, well, I think that's uh, about all we are looking to cover today. Hopefully you found this uh, interesting, helpful, or entertaining. Um, if you do, feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel, and blah, 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 blah. We'll catch you next time. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.